Hello, everyone, and welcome to Pint of Science. You're joining us here at the University of Warwick. Well, sort of. We're all at home. I know you probably are as well. We'd love to be there with you in the pub, but we're getting that way. We're going to be there soon. But this means that you get to join us from wherever you are in the world. I can already see in the comments, hello, Yorkshire. We've got a few people joining us from there already. Tell us where you're watching from. And we'll say hello as the show goes on. Now, you're here for Pint of Science, and that means hearing from some of the best academics, researchers, experts, all round know-it-alls about the most amazing topics in the world. So there's loads of events that you can find out more about using the hashtag Pint21 or going to pintofscience.co.uk. There's an absolutely jam-packed programme that's going to take you on a journey to learn a lot of cool things. Now, this session is no exception we are definitely going to take you on a journey. We're going on a journey through space. The very biggest journey you could imagine where the phrase, the sky is the limit, is sort of our starting point. We're gonna to go to infinity and, well, not beyond, because if I say we're going beyond infinity, the mathematicians get, they tell me off. So we're gonna to go to infinity and then to a slightly larger infinity just after that. We are going out into the emptiness of space, into the black void where there's nothing but the tiny pinpricks of stars and nebulae to look at. Imagine that as a holiday brochure. You're going to flick through. Oh, black void. No. Black void. No. And if you think it's hard to find a green light destination now, just imagine out there in the blackness of space. So we're going to need to know where we're going. We're going to need to have some power to turn the lights on, and we're going to need some expert crewmates to keep this ship running. Could you be one of our crewmates? Would you join us on this journey? Let us know in the comments again, say hi and tell us, would you join us on this spaceship? Would you go into space? Now, you might be wondering why we're talking space exploration. Well, we only have one planet at the moment. It's very important we look after this one because there is no planet B. But what we learn when we look out there might teach us to look after what we've already got. Or we might develop some new technologies that help us make this planet the best planet A that it can be. So we have got three amazing speakers for you tonight. If we could bring them up on screen so they can say hello to you. But we're really staffing this ship with the very best experts we can get. So Tish, if I can hand over to you, say hi. Hi, I'm Tish. I'm a solar physicist at the University of Warwick and I research earthquakes on the sun. Hi, I'm Claire. I'm a material scientist and engineer at the University of Warwick, working on manufacturing methods for batteries and other materials. Hello, I'm Mark. I'm an astrophysicist specialising in white dwarf stars. So that is quite the expert crew uh, designation for our ship, isn't it? They really are the experts you would want. Would you join us now that you've seen the experts, now that you know it's not just me on a pitch black ship with no lights? I think they're a bit more convincing than me, aren't they? So let's turn some lights on on our spaceship. Let's head over to our solar power expert to tell us how the sun works. Over to you, Tish. Awesome. Thanks, Phil. So let's get straight to it and chat about my favourite topic of all, the sun. So what comes to mind when we talk about the sun? It's incredibly huge, unbelievably hot, and really, really bright. And that's all well and good, but there's something that we don't talk about as often, and that's the interior of the sun, where all the magic's happening. So let's have a talk about it. So to paraphrase Shrek, the sun is like an ogre or an onion. It's got layers. And as we can see in this slide, there are three main ones, the core, the radiation zone, and the convection zone. And it's all surrounded by an atmosphere. So the question is, so the question is, what's going on inside? So all of these layers have their own unique properties and environments, and each in their own way ferry around the sunlight that illuminates our solar system. So the question is, how does a photon, which is just the name for a packet of light, escape from the core of a sun and through the maze of the solar interior and eventually reach us here on Earth? Well, let's follow its journey, starting with the Earth's core, the sun's core. So let's rewind just a little bit and talk about the creation of the photon. Our sun is mostly made up of hydrogen, which takes the form of a plasma, which is a soupy, gaseous mixture of atomic nuclei and electrons, all jumbled up together. This plasma is superheated and incredibly dense and can also carry electric charge. 
So the sun's core extends to about a quarter of the way up to the solar surface, but it contains a third of the sun's entire mass. This makes the pressure literally astronomically high. So this immense pressure forces a series of events, and the one of which we're interested in is called the proton-proton chain reaction, which isn't actually a chain reaction in the normal way we think about it, but instead describes how two protons, which are the nuclei of hydrogen atoms, can be fused together. And they're literally squished right up into a whole new particle, a helium nuclei. And this process of fusion gives out just a little bit of extra energy. And this extra energy is what makes up our photon. So side note here, this process of creating energy by fusing together protons is exactly how scientists hope to one day produce clean energy. Some fusion specialists have even been tasked with creating mini stars in their labs. And it's hoped that one day, we'll be able to harness the powers of the cosmos to turn on our kettles. Anyway, now our newly born photon has sprouted into existence, so let's leave the core and follow it into the next layer, the radiation zone. And this is where our photon encounters its next big obstacle. So this is the zone where I like to think that our photon is kind of like a child. For those of you who have kids, or like me, have had the absolute joy of being in a Zoom meeting in the last year, watching your kids just wreak havoc in the background, I'm sure you can agree that there's nothing like the unbridled energy of a five-year-old. They will run anywhere as fast as they want, and they will just bounce straight off whatever's in their way. And this is exactly how our photon behaves. Our highly energetic photon just needs to move somewhere, anywhere but the radiation zone is still incredibly dense. So the photon can only travel a few millimeters before it collides with the proton. Now, this proton acts as a sort of mirror. It bounces off the light and scatters it in a random direction. So now the photon travels in this new direction and almost immediately hits another proton. And again, it bounces and bounces and bounces each time in a random direction and in each collision, losing just a little bit of energy. So, after it bounces off and off, it being scattered all the way, which way is it going to end up going? So this is where we have to discuss something called a random walk. So this lovely resource here shows how we could simulate the randomness of a photon being bounced around inside the sun. So it's set up like this. It's got six sides, and each of the sides indicate the direction that a photon will travel after a collision. And by rolling a die, we can randomize this and see what would happen to a photon after five collisions by rolling a die five times. So to do this, I did ask Phil. I said, Phil, could you just bring along a regular die to the talk? And no, he's brought something even better. He's made one in his own robotics lab, I think, out of a Raspberry Pi, making it a Raspberry die. <laughs> so here it is. We're going to ask Phil to roll his die five times and see where our photon ends up. So we're going to start off in the center and see what happens. So, Phil, if you wouldn't mind rolling the die once. OK, so there's our first number. That's a five. Lovely. So our photon that starts in the core of our sun is going to go in this direction towards the five. Our next one. OK, next number is, uh, if I can hold it in the right place. There we go, a four. Amazing. A four. So we're going straight down south. OK, and then a two. Two up this way and a six six oh bringing us over here you can see why i'm rubbish at monopoly can't you <laughs> a three lovely our final roll takes us back actually straight back into the core so isn't that amazing after five totally random rolls of the die we've ended up back where we started so this path that we've drawn is known as a random walk which is also known as a drunkard's walk for reasons obvious to anyone who's staggered out of a pub at closing time. And you could see how you could keep this up for a really, really long time until you only completely by chance end up at the solar surface. So let's close the side and think about what our photon is doing. It's getting randomly scattered over and over, each time traveling only a few millimeters until it inches towards the solar surface. Scientists have found that the time it takes for a photon to travel all the way through the radiation zone up to the surface is somewhere between 10,000 and 170,000 years. This means that the sunshine that we see today was created when Neanderthals still walked the Earth. So 
Finally, after escaping the radiation zone, our photon still needs to find a way through our final and my favorite region of the sun. And this part is called a convection zone, and it extends from the top of the radiation zone all the way up to the surface. So convection is just another way that heat is transported, and we see it every day. When something gets heated up, it gets less dense, and so it becomes lighter and rises. After it rises, it becomes, begins to cool, gets a little bit heavier, and it falls. And so if you imagine this happening on a heating source, it's going to create a cycle of rising and then slowly cooling and then floating back down. So we can actually see this in action and we can see this at home. So this is something you can do in your own house, houses. So here I've put a bowl on the stove containing some diluted gold paint. And we can see how this convection current creates these gorgeous bubble-like patterns on the surface. And now let's compare this to what we see on the sun. This footage on the right-hand side shows a really similar bubbling pattern, which is also created by the sun's convection currents. And now these bubbles are known as granulation cells, and they're about the size of a continent. The ones here are about the size of the USA, and they exist for around 10 to 20 minutes. So our photon, which has been helped along by these flows, is finally dragged up to the solar surface, but it's almost free. It has one final region to get through. This is the atmosphere of the sun called the corona. Now, I know we've heard the word corona a lot in the last year, so please just bear with me, because oddly, this is where one of the biggest mysteries of the sun lies. So imagine you're walking away from a roaring fire. The further away you get, the colder it is. That makes sense. And this is the same thing in the sun. The core is the hottest, and as you get further away, it cools down, up until you reach the corona, where the temperature skyrockets. And this isn't by like some small amount. This is literally thousands of times hotter. Why? We don't know. This is one of the biggest areas of debate in the solar science community. But we're hoping with more space telescopes, more research, one day we'll be able to figure it out. So finally, having escaped the superheated corona, our photon has escaped the sun and can now fly through the mostly empty region of space in whatever direction it was last scattered in. Some of that light will end up by pure chance pointing towards the Earth. And now it's lost a lot of energy from being scattered around millions of times over thousands of years, but it still packs a punch. And the energy it has can be harnessed by plants or solar cells. I know next, Claire will be talking about how we can use solar cells in possible ways to power our spacecraft of the future. So after a whopping 100,000 year epic through the solar interior, our photon, our sunshine, finally reaches us and brightens our day concluding the journey of a solar photon. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tish. That was brilliant. Now, I know in, in some other talks, you've actually described the sun as being a bit like a bowl full of jelly, and we can talk about that another time. But if you were going to pick a flavour of jelly that the sun was going to be made of, what flavour would you pick? Oh, excellent question. Well, to me, the sun is hot. Hot things are spicy. And you know pineapple? It just makes your tongue zing a bit. So I'm thinking pineapple jelly. <laughs> OK, we've got pineapple jelly for the sun. Do you disagree with Tish at home? What do you think? What flavour would you pick for the sun? I know you've all prepared for this question and read up on it at home. But um, what flavour do you think the sun would be if it was made out of jelly? Now, we've already had some comments coming in to say that you would join us on this spacecraft. And as you can see, Thanks to Tish and the solar power that we're getting from the sun, we now have some lights on. So it's not a, a dark, flimsy tin can. So Zoe, don't worry, it's slightly better than your standards for getting into space. Um, and I mean, I've said thank you to Tish, but so have you in the comments. It's really nice to see the praise um, that we've had from Zoe. We've got a comment somewhere to say um, that, that she really liked Tish's talk. So thank you for that. Do remember to get involved and say hi to us in those comments. Now, Imagine if you if you were 100,000 years old and you had never managed to get anywhere, you just bounced off everything, and then you finally escape the sun only to fly through space, really long journey, and just crash into our solar panels. Would that be, would you be happy with that? Would you be satisfied? I don't think so. But the good news of this story is that parents of five-year-olds, they're not going to remain little bundles of energy like that for 10,000 years. Don't worry. So. We're journeying off into space. We're having a lovely time. We've got some crewmates on board. We've got Tish working on the solar panels, doing the spacewalks. But if you'll notice, these lights aren't very bright, are they? 
And that's because here on Earth, we're quite close to the sun. We get a lot of power from it. But as we journey off into space, we're leaving the sun behind. These stars become tiny little pinpricks of light instead. And that's not going to power this spaceship for long. We need a way to store some energy. Now, here on Earth, we can pump water uphill, store it in a reservoir, let it flow downhill overnight when the solar panel's not working, and use hydroelectric generators. But two problems with that. One, no spacecraft is big enough to take an entire reservoir. And two, there's not enough gravity there to make it work anyway. So we need a new way to store that energy. What are you thinking? What's the first thing you think of to store energy? That's right. It's batteries. And we're going to hand over now to our expert on batteries, who really puts the AA in space. Over to you, Claire. <laughs> Always lovely to be introduced by a pun. Thank you, Phil. And absolutely, what we think about when we think about a, sp a spacecraft out, like the International Space Station, we're thinking about the power coming from solar panels. So here's a lovely picture from NASA of the, the solar panels on the space station. And of course, there's lots of photons. We can gather our energy that way. But for 35 minutes out of every 90 minute uh, period, there's no sun instant on these solar panels. And we're not going to gather any energy anyway. So even for the technology we have right now, we need energy storage. So what do we do? We have batteries on the International Space Station. Periodically, they get replaced by the astronauts, typically having to do some really quite complicated work. And if they need to replace them, what do we do? We send up a SpaceX rocket or, you know, some kind of supply trip goes up there. We see them take off. We're all so excited to see it take off. And the next morning, maybe we see them get out and, and they're ready to go and they, they unload all their supplies. And that's great for a space station which is in orbit around our own planet and we know exactly what's going on we've we've known this for a while but what do we do if we're going to go deeper into space we're talking about going to mars mars is 259 days away that's seven months and that's just to get there we've got to do something while we're there and then come back and as we start to think about longer and longer missions as our mission heads out into the solar uh, system and beyond are we actually going to be doing missions where the astronauts will come back and can get some new supplies? Or are we realistically talking about taking everything we need with us or being able to gather it when we get there? So that's what I'm going to talk to you about today is how do we what battery technology do we have already on Earth and how can that be adapted to work as we move into these space missions and what do we need to do? So these are batteries. On the left hand side, you've got a beautiful drawing of a liquid base cell. And these are our classic batteries. These are our AA batteries, or something like that. They've got a cathode, the positive part, an anode, the negative part, and a liquid electrolyte between them. And you might remember from even you know, school chemistry, what happens when you have that separation of charges and you force the electrons to go round a circuit in order to go from cathode to anode um, and, and the power that that can generate. Well, what we're starting to move to as, as we develop our battery technology is something called a solid state battery. And you may have heard about these in context of moving to electric vehicles, but they are also very useful for, for thinking about space. A solid state battery is exactly the same principle as that liquid based cell that we're all perhaps slightly more familiar with. But instead of having the liquid electrolyte, you have a solid electrolyte. So the whole battery is a solid. We have a negative anode, we have solid electrolyte, we have um, the cathode, and then we'll typically have a separator and then a repeat of those units. We've only drawn two here for simplicity, but you can imagine them all stacked up. And the reason why that's good is there's a couple of really main reasons why these are good. One is they're safer. The electrolytes in the liquid based cells aren't particularly nice chemicals. Uh, they're very um, corrosive and they can cause a lot of problems if they leak. A solid state battery is all solid, so it's more durable in many ways. They also have better energy density, and that's particularly the reason why we're developing them for electric vehicles. Everyone wants to be able to take their electric vehicle and drive as far as they want without having to worry about charging it up all the time. So solid state batteries are the technology which is going to take us there. But I think they're also a great technology for thinking about if we need to actually make batteries in space. 
So how do we make a battery? Let's think about that first. So this is how we make a solid state battery. If we were going to make a liquid battery, it'd be very similar, but we'd add the liquid electrolyte. So the first thing we do is we make up something called a slurry. And a slurry is a mixture of particles of some kind of solid material mixed with a liquid. We make that quite thick and then we coat it onto the top of a piece of metal. And that coating is then dried. So we evaporate off the liquid. So we don't have any liquid anymore. It's just to get that nice flat surface. Then we do something called calendaring, which if anyone's ever made pasta or used one of those, um, there's some like Play-Doh machines that, that the kids um, have, um, you basically squash it all down like you're using a rolling pin. We typically squeeze it between two rollers to, to squash it all down and make it denser. And then we stack up our layers and put them all together. And that gives us a really nice battery. You can see the layers here in this sort of stack that look like my picture from before. So what do we need to think about if we were going to do this process in space? Well, one thing is, where do we need gravity to help us with this process in? Calendaring, for example, how are we going to push that pressure down if we need to do that in space? Are we actually going to be able to reproduce this in space if we have liquids and issues with, with that? Do we need to pre-make the components and take them with us, which would be a very interesting thing to think about. And the other question is, can we make really good batteries in space? Because if you want to make a really good battery, you want to get as much material into that solid electrolyte and the anode and the cathode as you can. You want it to be reasonably dense. And if you want to work with these materials and make them really dense, you have to do various processes to them to make them have that high density. Otherwise, they're just like a powder and it's not particularly attached to each other. So that's actually what my research focuses on, is looking at these electrolyte materials and similar materials and how can we make them denser? How can we make them contain more solid inside the, inside the structure? And in the context of thinking about making batteries in space, this is quite an interesting question, which relates quite closely to things we're already doing for Earth-based battery manufacturing. So the traditional way you would densify a ceramic electrolyte, like the ones we have in our solid state batteries, is to stick them in a high temperature furnace at really high temperatures. So we're above 1000 degrees for most of these materials for a really long time, like a day. And because the different materials have different temperatures that they need to go to, it's a bit like when you're cooking a roast dinner and half of the stuff needs to be cooked at 200 and half of it needs to be cooked at 140 and you can't put it all together. So you have to do it separately, which is what this icon is supposed to show, and then put them all together in an assembly process afterwards. So what we're working on in my research group at Warwick is looking at novel low temperature routes to attain the same effect the same densification and here's some pictures of two of them so these are quite simple diagrams of how we do this in one case it's called flash sintering so we still heat it up but to a lower temperature well below um a thousand degrees we attach a electric circuit to the part we want to densify so in this case we're only densifying the central solid electrolyte and we have our cathode and anode separately, heat it up to a modest temperature and stick a whacking load of electric current through this part. That densifies material by providing intense local heating just in the region we want to densify. So we can generate that densification without melting all the other bits of material that we have here. If we have bits of metal in our battery, they're going to melt at the temperature that we would take them to with the high temperature one. So that's a really great process that we're working on in the flash center and we can bring the temperature, the, the heat, uh, the manufacturing temperature down to really low temperatures um, for this kind of work. Then the other process we're working on at the moment is something called cold sintering. And this is cold because we basically do it at temperatures of about 150 to 300 degrees. And for someone who's used to heating things up to 1600 degrees that is a cold temperature so we're right down at low temperature and what we do is we mix our ceramic particles for our battery with a liquid so typically water but it can be something else uh, just a little bit not too much we heat it up to that modest temperature and we stick some pressure on it and that makes all the little bits of particles move around and densify and that gives us our, our properties so as we think about can we use these processes in space there's a few problems here and this was a bit of a debate in my research group, which was quite interesting. Which one would be better in space? 
Cold sintering is lower temperature, which is attractive, but you have to get the liquid in, which has handling problems, and you have to put the pressure on, which is difficult. Perhaps this is better for if we were on a planet with some gravity and we could, we could use the press in. With flash sintering, you need slightly higher temperatures, but what you basically need is lots and lots and lots of electricity. And actually, we can generate that in space, so that's not such a problem. So it's kind of interesting to think about which one would be the best suited. Now, another question about the resources that we might use to make these batteries in space is where are they going to come from? So that's the last thing I want to talk about in this, in this uh, discussion. So one way to approach this would be to say, we've got the batteries we've got. Maybe we take some spares, but not too many because you can't do that for a space trip. It's not like packing to go on holiday and you can use, you can take as much as you want because you're going in the car and it's all really easy. We have only got the payload we've got. So we've got to decide what we're going to take. So, okay, we take a, a double set of batteries and we recycle the old ones, which are worn out. And that throws up some interesting problems as well, which are also a problem on Earth. And this is the subject of a research program at Warwick, which very kindly Anwar gave me this photo of some shredded up pieces of battery. And you can see they're all mixed together. You can see a bit of copper in here. You've got metal here, black stuff, which is probably very carbony, matte, all sorts of bits of electrolyte, a real mess. We don't design our batteries to recycle them. And that's a problem here on Earth, and it would be a problem in space. And we need to start making them so they can be separated out into layers, like you know we've done with other things, like food packaging and things. We've divided things into layers, which are much easier to recycle. Okay, so that is one way that we could approach this. It's got its problems. We'd have to think about how we recharge the materials, what spares we need to carry, but that could be a really interesting way to approach this. But the final way that I would want to think about doing this, which is probably way into the future, is if we're going a really long way, are there useful materials out there that we could use? And you can't give a talk on space without putting up a picture of the rover. And this is, this is Perseverance up on Mars at the moment, doing a fantastic job. And one of the jobs that it's doing up there at the moment is looking at the geology of Mars, and looking at what chemicals are up there. And Typically on Earth, we use lithium in our batteries. There's probably not much lithium actually on Mars, but are there other materials like calcium or magnesium? We can use those to make batteries as well. Sodium, very Earth, um, on Earth, sodium is incredibly common because um, it's in salt and very accessible. And it'd be really interesting to move towards using some of those materials, which have less problems with their supply, uh, and even on Earth, let alone on Mars. And one thing we do need to do, and this is where Mark's going to take you next, is look at what useful materials are out there in space that we could possibly mine from planets, maybe even one day from, from other planet, uh, um, stellar bodies, and look at what we can do. So I hope that's been reasonably thought-provoking about what do we do to think about manufacturing batteries in space. We're at a really early stage with this research. Um, we still haven't mastered most of these techniques on Earth. So the idea that we've mastered them in space would be very um, advanced. But we've got some really keen researchers and that should give you hopefully some confidence that we can succeed in this mission. So thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. That was brilliant. And as you can see, because we've got our material scientists in our materials bay on board the ship, we have some bright shining lights and it's not caused by a lithium battery fire. Oh, hey. <laughs> so thank you very much, Claire. What I'd really like to do now is check in on some of the comments that we've had so that we can say hello to all of you. And remember, what I want you all to do is get involved and say hi to us, use the hashtag pint21, head over to pintofscience.co.uk and engage with us in this conversation. You can see those hashtags down at the bottom there. So do remember, come and say hello to us. So I'd like to say hello to some of you at home. So let's see where some of you are watching from. So if we could have a comment, we're gonna use the wonders, the magic of our producer, Emily backstage to bring up a comment to say hello to someone watching us uh, at home. I've been reading through some of these comments and we've got some all over the UK. Um, I've been able to see some up in Scotland. So hello to whoever it was was watching from Aberdeen. I'm, I'm afraid I've forgotten your name. Um, but we have got lots and lots of responses to say hi to us. Um, and we were also asking lots of other questions like, would you join us on this spacecraft? So um, are we able to get a comment up on screen just to 
show people. There we go. We've got Jean watching from Glasgow. Um, I'm sorry if I've missed the last one. My screen's over there. Um, <laughs> so hello. We've got Glasgow. We've got Aberdeen. So we've really got Scotland covered. Um, we've got two northerners watching from Bath. I can actually see the comments now. This is working a lot better, isn't it? So hello. Um, a strong northern contingent. Then we've had Yorkshire, Warwick. We've got Kenilworth. There we go. We've got the locals in. If we were in the pub, these are the people who would be able to join us. So hello to you. Um, and Zoe, thank you so much. This is such a nice thing to say about Tish. Um, that yeah, first person you choose to be on the spaceship, you've got to have power, haven't you? So I think that's absolutely um, the first person I would pick as well. Probably not me. You know, I'm just here talking to everybody. I'm not really doing the hard work of turning the lights on or keeping the solar panels working or for that matter, working out where we would go. So where would you go in space? You can't just go up and carry on going, can you? <laughs> I mean, if you asked me, I'd do what Claire said and go and visit Percy, go and visit Perseverance on Mars. But if you're not careful, we might run into something a little bit less friendly, maybe something like the Borg. And we don't want that. So we need our solar space science detective. We need someone who can sniff out elements of the periodic table from all of the way across the cosmos. And that is our expert, Mark. So Mark, over to you. Thank you, Phil. Um, yeah, uh, so we're... Um, we're about to head off onto this journey into space. Um, and as we've already heard from Claire, at some point, we're going to have to start thinking about things um, that we might want to make, whether we're going to be making some new structures, maybe new parts of spaceships, or making new batteries that we've also heard about. And so the question is, well, how do we actually detect any of these elements in space? We're down here um, on Earth um, looking up. And so how can we actually look at some of the things we see in space from so far away and say what they're made of? And the next question is, what do we see when we look at the different types of things in space? What do we see that they're made of? And to answer the first question, the answer is actually quite a simple one or can be condensed down into a, a simple answer. We use telescopes. Um, and this is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey Telescope in Arizona. And we already heard from Tish how the a photon can make its way out from the core of a star to the surface. Uh, but for stars in space, those photons are going to continue going. And if we're lucky, they'll make it to the Earth and even into our telescopes where we can detect those particles of light and, and make some measurements and indeed make some beautiful images that look like these. And this is actually a picture from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And you can see lots of beautiful stars and galaxies and all sorts of other things. Um, but the question is, how do we actually tell what any of these points of light are made of? Because, you know, they're, they're basically they're a bunch of dots, right? Uh, and, and to be clear, in, in just an image like this, yeah, you can't really see what something is, is made of. But that, that information is actually encoded in the light, and we just need the right tools to be able to make sense of it. And so to do that, we need to take some inspiration from Sir Isaac Newton, or perhaps even Pink Floyd, um, and use some kind of dispersing element. So we take our starlight from one particular star, we pass it through something like a prism or a diffraction grating, and that's gonna split up your light into its constituent colors, basically sp splitting it up into a rainbow. And then we can put some light detecting sensor in front of that rainbow, so something like a CCD chip, and essentially measure how much light, or how much light we measure at each specific color. And this allows scientists to do something that scientists really just love to do, and that's make graphs, but not any graph. This graph is called a spectrum, um, and it looks something like this. So this is a spectrum of a star, um, not too different into the, that of the sun. And it's exactly what I described before. It's how much light on the y-axis versus um, the color on, on the x-axis. So we are li literally looking at how much light we get at each color, although we tend to think of it in terms of wavelength. And I, at the top here, I've just put the range of wavelengths that your eyes are sensitive to so that you can sort of get a sense of scale for that. And now when you look at this spectrum, you'll notice that there are lots of interesting little features in here. There are certain specific colors of light where we don't detect quite, uh, uh, quite as much. Um, and these narrow features, we call them absorption lines. And what they represent is um, the, uh, 
the transitions uh, of atoms, so the quantum transitions of the electrons in atoms um, that exist within the atmospheres of these stars. And so this particular um, absorption line that we see here is called hydrogen alpha. It's a it's obviously, as I say, it's a transition of the hydrogen atom. And so that tells us that this star has hydrogen in its outer layers. Not only that, we can see some other atoms, though. We can see calcium, magnesium, and sodium. And so the spectra kind of, in a way, act like a little barcode telling you what's in a star. But not only does it tell you what's there, it actually, you can actually use a spectrum to show you how much of each element is there as well. And because the photons that you're collecting with your telescope have traveled from the outer layers of these stars, they tell you something about the physical conditions um, from which they were emitted. And this includes things like the temperature, the pressure, the density, even magnetic fields are things that we can measure um, using uh, spectra like these. And so this answers, answers the first question, how do we measure what things uh, are made of in space? Um, but the second question, um, where do we look and, and what do we see? Uh, to, to answer that, we need to consider the life cycle of a star. So on the left, we're looking here, starting with a stellar nebula, which is basically a big cloud of gas, atoms and molecules. And indeed, actually, if you take a microwave spectrum of a, a nebula like this, you can see interesting things um, like water molecules, even alcohol molecules, while after all, this is pint of science. Though I should say these aren't the kinds of alcohols you want to be um, ingesting, if you value your eyesight, at least. Um, and so. A, uh, due to uh, so uh, the, these uh, clouds of gas, they can collapse down essentially into uh, forming stars um, eventually and producing things like the sun. Um, at the more massive stars, there are only a few percent of all stars overall um, can eventually undergo supernovae. And we won't really be talking about those for the rest of the talk. And what I want to focus on is this journey that almost every star, including the sun, uh, will one day make. Uh, and so after billions of years of burning hydrogen fuel in their cores, uh, stars like the sun will be transition into red giants where eventually they'll blow off their outer layers in a sort of gentle process, uh, essentially kind of like a wind. And that produces a new nebula, which for horribly historic reasons we call a planetary nebula, but that gas can then feed back into space, generating the, the uh, new star formation. But the core of that star gets left over and compacted down and forming what we call a white dwarf star. Um, and so it's these two areas that I will be talking about mostly for, for the rest of the talk. So we've seen already um, one spectrum of a, of a sun-like star, or as scientists tend to call them, main sequence stars. And I thought I'd just show two here so you can really see that um, for stars, and this is just two stars of different temperature, really, um, that the spectra really do look quite different. And so we can use that information to learn about different stars. But the question is, if we were to go to these stars, how do we get any of the elements that are there? We can't actually just take a bucket and spade, go to the surface of the sun and scoop some up and and be on our way. Um, but what we might like to think about is whether or not these stars have any planets and whether we can learn anything about those. And so planets around other stars, we call those exoplanets. And the main way these days that we detect exoplanets is use the using the transit method, where if a planet passes in front of its host star, it blocks out a small fraction of the star's light. And so um, when we look at the light curve, as it's called, the brightness of the star over time, we see a small dip in that brightness um, uh, uh, due to the, the planet moving in, in front of the star. And because exoplanets themselves have an atmosphere, um, that atmosphere at some wavelengths, at some colors, will look essentially transparent, but other wavelengths will look opaque. At those opaque wavelengths, um, the planet itself looks a little bit bigger. And so what we can do is look at the the size of a planet at lots of different wavelengths to essentially build up a spectrum of a planet's atmosphere. And when we do that, we can end up seeing something like this. So this is for one particular planet, and we see that at this particular wavelength, um, we see that the planet looks a little bit bigger, and that tells you that there's water molecules in the planet's atmosphere. But this, this just tells us about the atmosphere. Surely we want to be going and looking at the solid stuff, the stuff that we could potentially be mining. And to do that, um, we actually need to go somewhere quite surprising. Um, we actually need to look at a different type of thing altogether. We need to look at white dwarf stars. So this is my favorite type of uh, object that I work on. 
Um, and as I said before, these are basically the former cores of stars like the sun. And you can think of them as basically being about half the sun's mass compacted down into about the volume of the Earth. And this gives them really extreme densities of about a ton per cubic centimeter. So really dense objects. Um, and also with it really strong surface gravitational fields, about a million times um, what you're experiencing right now, just sitting on your chair watching this talk. And the result of that is we expect white dwarfs generally to have fairly simple spectra of just either hydrogen or helium. Um, but in about a quarter of white dwarfs, we find that they also have heavy elements as well that must have been put there recently. Um, for example, in this white dwarf spectrum, we see evidence of calcium, magnesium, and iron. And we understand now that these elements um, come from pieces of planetary material that have fallen onto the white dwarf surface. And so the picture that we have is that things like, yeah, asteroids, maybe even comets sometimes can come in close to the white dwarf and the extreme gravitational field will shred them up into dust, forming something that looks a little bit like Saturn's rings in a way. And that material can then flow onto the white dwarf surface where we can measure it using spectroscopy. And so in this case, you see an ultraviolet spectrum where we see 11 different elements in the outer layers of this star. And that actually allows us to propagate back and work out what these pieces of planetary material are made from uh, and what types of what types of planetary composition we're looking at. And so uh, now I'm just going to show you a couple of spectra here that you can see look very, very different. Um, these are spectra that I took myself a few years ago. And this is despite the fact that the two stars are about the same temperature, yet they, like I say, they look very different. In the top one, we have lots of calcium and in fact, quite a bit of titanium as well, which is an element that we might want to use to make some some high-tech stuff out of, uh, as well as quite a lot of sodium. Whereas in the bottom spectrum, we basically see just iron and nickel and practically nothing else. And if you know anything about what the Earth is made of, that might get you thinking about the Earth's core, which is basically just a giant piece of iron and nickel. And indeed, when we look at other things in the solar system, we do see examples of asteroids and meteorites and things like that, um, that have this iron nickel rich composition. And so the final thing I want to talk about um, before I finish is some new research that we've been done recently at the University of Warwick, um, where we, for the first time, think that we've detected pieces of planetary crust that have actually made their way onto the surface of white dwarf stars. And the reason we think that is because we've detected some elements that are uh, uh, rich in the Earth's crust, um, as we know it, um, but we haven't seen before other white dwarfs, and that's lithium. Um, and in one case, we also saw potassium. And as we heard earlier, lithium is a great element that uh, we use to make batteries. And so that's the kind of thing that when we go on these journeys uh, that we might be wanting to think about um, uh, for, for mining, for building our new batteries. And so, yeah, I just want to round off by saying that, yeah, white dwarfs are perhaps one place that we might want to go um, to to look at um, for finding material for the kind of things we'll need on these journeys. And I'll stop there, thank you. Fantastic, thank you very much, Mark. I think that was a brilliant talk. And uh, you mentioned alcohol, so cheers. It is pint of science after all. But what I'm worried about is if you actually have a pint at the density you just said of the white dwarf stars, that's going to be 568 tons of science, and that is a lot for anyone to bring on board. Now, if you're wondering what I'm drinking, this is, of course, the espresso martini. And if you'd like to find out how to make one, remember to tune in tomorrow for Warwick's second Pint of Science session, which is Cocktails, Chemistry and Creativity. So you can find out more about all of the events that are happening at Pint of Science with the hashtag Pint21 or by going to pintofscience.co.uk. So one more sip. Hmm. Yeah, you really need to tune in and find out how to make that. It's brilliant. There is so much more to our journey than just what we've talked about so far. So we've seen lots of suggestions in the comments for the extra stuff that we could talk about. Obviously, we only have an hour, but lots of other people have an hour as well. So you can tune into some of the other talks this week to find out answers to more of your questions if we haven't covered everything you want us to talk about. So you might be thinking, if we're traveling for that far into space with very slow traditional uh, rocket booster engines, how are we gonna survive that long? Are we going to need to have a whole colony ship or 
maybe we can use some technology to improve our health. And if you want to know more about that, stay tuned straight after this session to hear from the University of Leeds in their Pint of Science session as well. Now, we've had some engineering, we've had some chemistry, we've had a lot of physics in this session, but we don't like to leave anybody out. We've also brought the life scientists aboard and the arts combined in one graphic t-shirt. This is from Ellie Jameson, who's one of the life science staff at Warwick. So thank you for the t-shirt. I think this is a very fitting phage swallowing the entire world t-shirt design. I absolutely love it. Now, that's our journey so far. Let's see what you can bring to our spaceship. Let's see what you would like to find out more about. So if we could bring our experts back up onto the screen here and we'll see what the questions are from all of you. So I'm going to radio into ground control and ask if we could have our first question up on the screen, please. So it does take a little time, as you know, as you travel out into space, obviously transmissions take a little bit of time. They can only travel at the speed of light. Um, I did see one suggestion in the comments that we could speed up or slow down the speed of light. That is way beyond the technology we brought on the ship, I'm afraid, but there we go. So I believe our first question should be coming in from, um, it's a question going to, um, probably to Tish actually, isn't it? It's from Alex Holmes. Um, so ground control, if we could have the question from Alex Holmes, please. There we go. So Alex is a biologist. Um, she's actually one of the biologists who's been helping the lead session I was talking about that you should definitely stick around for. Um, so she's not used to being up in space, um, as obviously you are, Tish. How on earth do you actually measure temperature in space? Ooh, that is an excellent question. Um, so one of the really interesting things is that things at different temperatures emit light at different wavelengths. So wavelengths is just a fancy way of talking about colours. So if we were to measure the colour of a piece of light, we would know something about the temperature um, that caused it. So for example, if we look at um, a flare going off on the sun, we can see that the top of a flare, so a flare is just a bright flash, a huge burst of energy we can see where on the flare it was really, really bright. It was bright in colors like blue and purple. So we know it's really, really hot. Whereas there are other regions of the flare that might be a more red or an orange color, which counterintuitively mean they're quite cold. So color means temperature in space. I think that's a great answer. Um, yeah, because you don't really want to have to have a really long thermometer that would reach all the way from here to the sun. Do you? I don't think that would quite work. Um, OK, our next question um, should be, so ground control, if we could have the question from Andrew Tipman, um, which I'm going to ask Claire about. Um, so this question, I think, was just, it was really, really interesting. So we were trying to think oh, about, no. oh, OK, we've got a question here. I'm going to send that over to Mark instead, actually. We've got, um, what about the use of telescopes? If you tell us when we're looking for um planets that are orbiting other stars. You mentioned how we detect them by looking at the, you know, the brightness going up and down and that kind of thing. But how do you find them in the first place? So I, I think this uh, particular question actually concerns planets themselves that um, uh, aren't even around stars, I think, is, is what we're looking at here. So there are... I didn't even know that was a thing. Unless I uh, misunderstood the question. No, it's probably um, me. You go ahead. <laughs> So we, we do see some some planets that uh, sort of some evidence of planets that aren't around um, stars at all, or that may have been ejected from their their, their own little solar systems, uh, and yeah, that obviously planets like these not being around a star, they they don't really give off much of their own light, at least not something at the level that we could necessarily detect. Uh, and so the question is, how could we uh, think about detecting those? Um, and what we see is, uh, what we can see is things called micro lensing events, where we see um, uh, gravitational lensing. So if you if you've seen the film Interstellar, where you have gravity, if you have that black hole having an extreme gravitational lensing effect, you can sometimes get a very very tiny amount of. Um, uh, a very tiny amount of gravitational lensing, even from something as small as a planet, where, say, a background galaxy or a background star might suddenly brighten for a very small amount of time. And so in that way, we're able to potentially detect um, free-floating planets, as they're sometimes called, even um, 
without being able to see the planet itself. But the problem is, is that you only get one shot really at detecting that planet before you don't see it again. Fantastic. Thank you, Mark. And and Andrew, um, clearly, you know, you've asked such a good question, it, it baffled the host who was asking it. So I think that is the mark of a very good question indeed. So our next question, um, if we bring that up on the screen, but just while that's coming up, I just want to say thank you to everyone for getting so involved because it is so great to see all of these questions coming in down the side. It's so great to hear from all of you. And it's important to us that we are sharing science with you but we're finding out about what you're interested in and learning from you as well. I've just learned about interstellar planets, so there we go. So Alex has asked another question here. So hello, Alex, again. Um, so this might be a question that all of you could comment on. I think I'm gonna go to, let's go to Mark, for, no, let's go to Claire first. Um, are there any situations where having zero gravity would actually help you? What kind of, what kind of things could you build in space you couldn't build on Earth? Yeah, I saw this question go by and I thought, oh, that's interesting, because most of the time in the sort of manufacturing I mostly do, we want pressure. We want it to pull down and add to that. So the gravity really helps us. But actually, if you think about what would happen if you don't have any gravity, well, it would make it a lot easier to make a foam. It would enable you to avoid something called sedimentation, where if you have particles in suspension in a liquid, they'll gradually drop down. There's a the Stokes law, which was a very famous law that says that the particles will fall down according to their density um, and the viscosity of the liquid. So you could avoid that. So you could suspend particles without them falling. And that could be really interesting for making batteries, for example, what would happen then if we don't have sedimentation. Um, and if you don't have um, any gravitational pressure, crystal growth is a lot easier. So if we think about making things which are either single crystals, so that can be used in functional devices, or if we think about making um, layers which are like single crystals, so they're very, very thin layers, making them and stacking them up, we make a lot of devices that way. Actually, having no gravity really helps with that. So it's a really interesting question for me because we're so used to having to deal with gravity and actually take advantage of it. But there are some systems that are better with gravity, in manufacturing at least. Mm, absolutely. I think that's really interesting. There's another thing called the Brazil nut effect, which is all about cereal. So clearly cereal science is where I'm, I'm meant to be. When you get the different layers, when you get like a granola or something, they all separate out. Um, okay. And Mark, I just wondered whether there was anything interesting with telescopes when you build those in space or even take them up into space after you've built them. That you might be able to detect different things with that. Yeah, so one of the things that um, that space allows you to do is to see wavelengths of light that are difficult to look at um, look at from the ground. So the, the wavelength of light that most ground-based telescopes look at is either in the optical, where the sky is basically transparent, or in the radio, where the sky is also fairly much transparent. But say at mid-infrared wavelengths and ultraviolet and X-ray wavelengths, the, the sky itself looks opaque so to be able to actually detect any of the those uh, wavelengths you basically need a space telescope and so that's why we spend a lot of money um, putting um, telescopes into space to actually learn about things that we just can't do with a telescope on the ground mm, absolutely and i suppose you don't get pigeons nesting in the telescopes in space either um, and leaving unhelpful deposits let's say um so one thing I, I mentioned as a very throwaway comment right at the start of this session is that Tish has described the fun as being like a bowl of jelly. Um, so one thing I've I thought of after you'd said it, and I, I only realized this afterwards, you can't get pineapple jelly because it contains that enzyme that dissolves your tongue and that's why it makes your tongue feel weird and it stops the jelly from setting. So if, if there's some magic out there that makes pineapple jelly that you know of, um, to be fair, it'd be more magic to make an entire sun out of jelly, wouldn't it? But there we go. Um, so the question just came in, have you ever tasted pineapple jelly? I'm <laughs> guessing it's no. No, that's a no. <laughs> okay. I've also so maybe... the sun, so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't think many of us have. Um, why do you describe the sun as being like a bowl of jelly? Ooh. Well, I mean, it's like we said earlier, um, the sun isn't a solid. It's not like this one rigid body we've already discussed. It's got these layers. And interestingly, um, these layers are all quite fluid and squishy. It's like a jelly or like a water balloon, uh, more closely than, say, the Earth is, where it's quite rocky. 
Um, and if we know one thing about jelly, it's that it can wobble. Um, so those convection currents that we mentioned earlier, they can drive things that are known as standing waves. So these standing waves are basically oscillations that reverberate through the entire sphere of the sun. And these standing waves are like the sounds that you hear in a kettle. In a kettle, you get this sort of noise, this sort of gurgling that's driven by these convection currents. And it's the same thing on the sun. We get these convection currents setting up these sounding waves, these standing waves that we can sort of hear, we can detect them. And there are literally thousands of them every minute going on all the time. It's sort of like if you were to put a bell in a sandstorm, it just continually gets hit, gets excited and gives out these waves. And in the same way that we can listen to a bell and hear its pitch and from the pitch, we can deduce something about the bell. So if you heard like a really low ringing, you'd probably know it's a really big bell. If it's a high pitch, you know, it's a small bell. And then depending on the tone and the sort of um, timber that you get from the pitch, you can figure out maybe what the bell's made of. You can tell if it's brass or steel or something like that. And well, that's what I do. That's my job. So we listen to the sounds and the songs of the sun. And from that, we can deduce uh, things about the inside of the sun, about what it's made of, about how big it is and even how old it is. And we don't just do this for the sun. This is a property of all stars, even the ones that Mark studies. Um, and we can listen to the sounds of the cosmos and find things out, which I find is really cool. Fantastic. Yeah, I think that's a really good way of bringing in the sun, which obviously you can't bring into your own home, but bringing it, making it real for people. I mean, I thought that lemon jelly would be a good shout, but now after your talk, I think it's got to be something layered. So, I mean, that's, that's quite a complicated jelly, if you ask me. Um, now, I think one question that was really, really brilliant was about why batteries actually deteriorate, because I'm sure we've all got batteries in the you know, rechargeables that just don't hold any charge anymore, or your phone maybe a year or two into use. Um, so thank you, Peter, for this question. I think Claire is in our, our battery lab on board the spaceship. So Claire, if I can ask you that question, what, what is it that batteries actually deteriorate? Yes, absolutely. It's because they cycle and they have a certain amount of life. So we push a chemical reaction through these batteries and they cycle around. And when they do that process, the material changes. It's not completely static in its properties. So especially with a lithium battery, you have a process called delithiation. And when you lose your lithium, it gets incorporated into that electrolyte and then it's not available for use in the electrochemistry. So you're effectively losing that part of the battery and gradually over time you end up with a battery that just doesn't work. Now it is possible to re-lithiate a battery and especially when you think about the recycling process. I know we had another question about recycling. Um, when we recycle batteries we're looking to do a couple of things. We're looking to reuse what we can, re-lithiate what we can, so we might look at you know can we change the electrolyte, especially in a, a short battery, um, or can we reuse the components? And part of it's about safety and disposing of batteries safely. And that's why it's important to put them into the right waste disposal channel. Um, and we can then try and recycle what we can. And we're increasing that all the time with our research. Fantastic, thank you. And I think that's a really nice explanation for people to understand. It's not just their phone that's going, it's just the nature of these lithium batteries. Now, I wish that we could sit and answer every single one of these questions because some of them have been so fantastic and so insightful, but that is pretty much all the time that we have got left. So I would like to say a massive thank you, and I'm sure all of you will in the comments as well, a massive thank you to all of our expert crewmates. So thank you to Tish, thank you to Claire, thank you to Mark, and the people that you haven't seen at home, we've also got Emily, our producer, back in ground control. So thank you very much to you. And don't forget everybody that we are here all the time to talk to, that we will engage, that we are here to share this science with you and communicate and share and have a conversation about it. So do get involved with the hashtag Pint21 or find us on Twitter with um, at Warwick Engages. That's how you can find out all about Warwick's public engagement activities and everything that we get up to to share science with the public. There are so many events with Pint of Science coming up and also things like Coventry City of Culture that obviously Warwick being based near Coventry, we're very, very involved with. You can find out all about those events using the hashtag Resonate Festival. We'll all be taking part in that and bringing you lots more science content over the next few months. So again, a massive thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you to our producer, Emily. Thank you to all of you for watching at home. And just remember, that if you are ever out in space in a flimsy tin can, remember you're gonna need some power, so bring some batteries and some solar panels, and remember that you need to know where you're going, so follow the data from those telescopes. Thank you all for watching, that's all from me.
Good night.